So, you know, that brings us, I think, to one of the last segments we'll talk about, which is, you know, so you, you now, if we're all going to start using this and doing a variance suppression of more and more people, then we're going to have bone problems with more and more people. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think that, you know, in the most recent meta-analysis presented at San Antonio this year, you know, at least to me, it's fairly clear, and it was a single patient Oxford meta-analysis, that it, adding bisphosphonates to women who are postmenopausal provides a 3% 10-year survival benefit. Overall, not progression-free, an overall survival benefit. So the question is, and the question is really, should we be using adjuvant uh, bisphosphonates in these people who we are now making either ovarian suppressed through our, or they're already postmenopausal to begin with? What do you think? So it, it's a sticky situation. When I first saw the ABCSG data, I, I just hopped right on that bandwagon. I was so excited <laughs> that we had something to give patients outside of more chemotherapy uh, who are very high risk with ER positive breast cancer. And then Azure came out and my heart was broken. And I called all my patients who were premenopausal and said, I think we're doing the wrong thing and you shouldn't be on zoledronic acid. And the meta-analysis is kind of nice because it gives us, you know, sort of supports what Azure showed, which is the postmenopausal patients do, or, you know, in the evident in the context of a low estrogen state, using zoledronic acid appears to be protective. And biologically it makes sense. The problem is getting coverage for it and getting the insurance companies to, mm -hmm. and which regimen do we use? Do you do it every six months for three years? Do you do it for five years? Is denosumab any better? Are we putting them at risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw and uh, atypical fractures and hypocalcemia? So it's, it's quite complex um, in terms of thinking about this and thinking through. What I start with is a bone density. And if my patient has totally normal bones or minimal osteopenia, I, I usually don't go there unless mm -hmm. they have multiple positive nodes and, and really want me to try and get it approved. But if they're moderate or severe osteopenia, then I try to get uh, zoledronic acid approved as the annual sort of bone strengthening uh, regimen. Yeah. But you get it. Um, see, that's, this is the issue. So I think that the uh, meta-analysis was quite interesting, had exactly the same approach, except I didn't call my premenopausal women. <laughs> but anyway, I, because they were postmenopausal in Azura, and plus they were such a mishmash in Azura. You know, it's like such a gr different group of patients, you know, with chemo, et cetera, and triple negatives and everything. But I think that uh, I, I believe that this probably adds something to treatment. But I have to say that over the last year, the insurers in California have been universally denying the use of bisphosphonates uh, in this setting and denosumab. And so we, we can't give it. And I had always been giving zoledronate every six months as opposed to the yearly five milligram approach because that's how it was studied. And I, and I felt actually fairly comfortable that if you were to give seven doses of zoledronate a la ABCSG12, that the risks are gonna be minuscule and they didn't really see anything in ABCSG12 that was different between the arms. So, uh, but I don't know how we're overcoming this issue. So I do bone mineral densities also. And uh, if their bone mineral density is okay, there's no way we're ever gonna get the drug proof. So based on the data we have, and I guess, you know, balancing it out, I'm not, sure enough that in those patients there's the benefit to make it worth it. I know, but uh, you know, I, I agree with everything you guys have said, but on the other hand, you know, you've got a 3% survival benefit at 10 years. That is a survival benefit from chemotherapy in ear positive breast cancer. In, in a meta-analysis. In the same, in a meta-analysis in the same patient population. But they, they you know, and that's the thing I can't get, I can't wrap my arm around it. The meta-analysis although it was a post hoc meta-analysis, yeah. right? Because they knew the benefit of Mazur was in postmenopausal, so they asked that question. I know. And, and, and to be devil's advocate, we did see similar small benefit in with clodronate in B34. It was right. very small, and so I you think can argue that you can do clodronate, I totally but then I would do too, big pills that are not easy to take. Right, I think clodronate is fine too. I, you know, I think it could be with just it's about any bisphosphonate. Okay. And, and so, but <laughs> that gets us <laughs> back to, but that gets us back to, to, I just want to talk briefly at the end here too about denosumab. So, you know, we have denosumab. Do you think we have a trial Okay, a DCARE that was completed as a large randomized trial. We have the SWOG study with, with uh, which is not denosumab, but we have that that's still out there. That doesn't really have a no treatment arm, unfortunately. But let's get to denosumab for a minute. So does, does, do you kind of substitute denosumab now in your practice for zoledronic acid? In the adjuvant setting? No, no in the, let's talk metastatic first, the metastatic setting. 
what's well, approved for the treatment yeah. of you use it? But yeah, use it. Yeah. It's a subcutaneous, yeah. especially. Our, our oncology use it exclusively. Yeah, I think so. Do you use it instead of zolondronic acid, do you think? Yes. I do. do. Yeah, Most people do. Easy to and give, so, similar side effect profile. Right. Yeah. And so do you use it, do you guys ever see hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia with it? I actually advise, and I send it out to the pra everybody in our practice every few months, every six months or so, remember to tell them to take 500 milligrams of calcium a day because they've actually, there's a black box warning yeah, for denosumab. There's yeah. fatal hyper hypocalcemia seen with that, that drug. So I think we do have to be aware of it and make sure they're taking their calcium. So that's, I tell them to take calcium. That's yeah, and I think that's standard of care. I think you, uh, I don't think anyone would give a denosumab or ozolindronic acid without uh, calcium because of, correct, because of the hypocalcemia. But, uh, you know, giving it based on the meta-analysis and, and the, the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw, because you do see it, and, and people do have, uh, you know, do, do get dental work done. And even without dental work, you see ONJ. So I think we really definitely need uh, more data to use it uh, early on. I have on my first it. patient who has a not yet a stress fracture, but something that's called, I don't know, some tenting or something of her femur, who has been on very long durations, alledronate, and then denosumab. But, you know, she was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in 1996, mm -hmm. and she's been on some form of bone-modifying drug probably for 12 years. I stopped a year ago, but she's now had several. And she has a, um, she has the, uh, this osteonecrosis thing, which is in the middle of her roof of her mouth. Which is very rare to get it in the roof of your mouth. Yeah, but I've had a number of patients It happens, though, in the maxilla. Don't you guys, like, stop every so often? Like, don't you have to yeah, take a break the, after one, to let the bone, remo uh, bone remodel well, a little bit? The they I mean, don't get rid so, of it. So, you know, there's data now for zolondronic acid every 12 weeks instead of every four. Does anybody use that? Not. Yeah, I don't yeah. give it every month anymore. So every for three long months. term, yeah, definitely long term, every, every three, three months, absolutely. But do you do the same thing with the nosomab? Do you kind of make that leap yet or not? So not. We're, all just, yeah. we're all just we have no idea. shooting in the dark here, right? We have no it's, clue. It's right. Well, six no weeks clue. if they're on an every three week regimen. Yeah, there for you sure. go. Every six, I do the same <laughs> thing, right? Exactly. <laughs> Even though it's not standard of care by the FDA approved modification. But That's yes, true. It's, it's often medium. whenever they come in. Right. Yeah, the absolutely. median number of doses that patients have received of zoledronic acid by the time they develop ONJ is something like 32. So it's right around that three yeah. year mark of monthly. Mm -hmm. So I tend around year two to pull back on frequency of whatever drug they're on. But again, there's there's no data to tell us what to do. Good. I mean, I think to summarize, I think we all basically do use denosumab. You know, in the adjuvant setting, we'll have to see what DCARE shows. Um, it is a randomized, you know, at least a placebo-controlled trial, so we'll find out what happens. So again, I think we've had a really good conversation. I think we all, you know, had a good time. Do you have any comments at the end? Hope we'll start with you. Any other comments? And one of the things we didn't talk about much, which I'm really excited about, we, we briefly mentioned it, was the host response. We're yeah. all really interested in this idea of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We now have uh, these uh, macrophage inhibitors that we're studying, actually, and are being studied in combinations with a variety of different cancers uh, to try and alter the immune repertoire. And then, of course, there are the PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, which target the death receptor pathway. And, uh, you know, we've seen, I think there's been anecdotally reported, not yet formally, uh, single agent responses in triple negative disease with a variety of agents. So I think that, uh, you know, we're looking to the future for that also, as well as other targeted therapeutics that might be able to be given more rationally based on markers. And we'll see what happens. No, I would agree. I mean, exciting times, a lot of new drugs, uh, but challenging times too, how we're going to incorporate that in a multitude of drugs yeah. when the federal funding is getting less and less. And so we'll see. I'm pretty excited about PARP inhibitors um, really? in the BRCA, um, really? BRCA realm and maybe potentially in the future in, in the basal-like or BRCA NAS subset. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see how some of these larger trials turn out. Um, and um, I think I agree with Hope. There's just so many new targeted therapies that are so exciting to be look, um, exciting to, you know, it's an exciting time to be a part of this uh, field. Very different as, as, as a community oncologist, as you've seen. Uh, we, we don't run many of the clinical trials. We, ha we try to enroll as many patients as we can in clinical trials, and we're very appreciative of everyone acad in academics that, that, that uh, does uh, designs and, and runs these clinical trials. Um, very important for us as uh, community oncologists to know that it's not one-size-fits-all treatment of uh, breast cancer, both adjuvant and metastatic breast cancer. And I think uh, it, it, with eventually it will reveal itself, the correct sequencing of many of these, uh, these drugs that we already have and, and the drugs that are to come.
Great. You know, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, the most important thing to me, you know, that I've been doing this for a while, is really I think we're starting to think about the host. I mean, we have some really interesting drugs like Bevixizumab, which didn't work as well as we thought it would, um, Zolendronic acid, which may work better than we think it would, that really are host drugs, really affect the host and not necessarily the tumor. And I think that, I think as a group of medical oncologists and surgeons and people who study breast cancer, I think looking at the host is, I think, really an important issue here. And I think that we'll start to see that. But again, we do have the challenges on the other end, you know, of reduced federal funding, you know, a limited pie of insurers that are really focusing really on cost effectiveness. And I think that, you know, both at the academic and community levels. And I think that it's really going to be a challenge, you know, where we have a great, you know, we have all this great stuff out there. You know, we just have to figure out how to get it to people in the most efficient fashion. But again, I want to thank everybody. Go ahead, Terry. No, and also, and also the fact is that we're a victim of our success, you know, particularly in the right. Hurtusetti. How do you study new drugs when you already have made outcomes so good right. with all these new treatments? Right. We'll have so. to learn from the, from the uh, germ cell tumor uh, group. But anyway, but I'd like to thank everybody. I think this is really great. Um, you know, we had, a, I think, a very good discussion. And again, thank you very much.